Okay, so since it's the week before spring break, most of you probably won't show up to class anyway. I'm just going to record a video and I'm going to post that. So here we go. We are starting in Unit 3, so we're going to be going over the reports. And first of all, let's talk about the federal court system versus the state court system. So in the federal court structure, at the very bottom, you've got the United States District Courts. A step up, you've got the United States Courts of Appeals. And at the very top, you've got the United States Supreme Court. So let's start by talking about the Supreme Court, since that's kind of timely right now. What qualifies someone for being, for serving on the Supreme Court? The answer is, there really are no qualifications. Pretty much anyone can be there if they, as long as they are appointed by the president and confirmed by the Senate. Just remember that the Supreme Court justice, any Supreme Court justice, is appointed by the president and confirmed by the Senate. All right, the next level down, you've got the United States Court of Appeals. And below that, United States District Courts, kind of self-explanatory with those. And a Supreme Court Justice serves for life. Once you are, once you are appointed and confirmed, you're pretty much there forever until you either die or retire. Right? And when there is a decision made in the courts, you will have a majority opinion, which is the opinion of the majority of justices, and then you will have a minority opinion, which is often called the dissenting opinion. And the majority opinion and the dissenting opinion, these are often used in legal precedent later on. All right, let's go to jurisdiction. We've got three main levels of jurisdiction. There's the subject matter jurisdiction, Geographical jurisdiction, which is the one you're probably most familiar with, given that we just finished the policing unit. And hierarchy. So yeah, subject matter jurisdiction, kind of imagine that, kind of like geographical jurisdiction, where you would have some police officers, like a state police officer for Indiana can't just go and pull someone over in Kentucky because that's out of their jurisdiction. So when it comes to subject matter jurisdiction, that means like if you're a court, like if you're a divorce court, you handle divorces. Dude, Hi. what are you doing in here? I'm filming a lecture video. You, I, I gotta use the bathroom. Oh. Should dude, I? Dude, get out of here. Well, that was rude. Okay. So anyway, back to subject matter jurisdiction. Once again, think of it like the geographical jurisdiction, like the example I used of a Kentucky State Police Officer or Indiana State Police Officer can't go to a different state and arrest someone. So if it's your subject matter jurisdiction, oh, hi, what are you doing? All right, there was a squirrel. And when I tilted my phone, those people thought I was trying to film them. Anyway, okay, back to that. Subject matter jurisdiction. If your subject matter is divorce court, then you wouldn't go to divorce court with a speeding ticket. They only handle issues of divorce. So that would be an obvious example of subject matter jurisdiction. So that's pretty self-explanatory. So the hierarchy jurisdiction, it's like the Supreme Court is the highest court. You're not going to get a speeding ticket and automatically go to the Supreme Court. I mean, it, in theory, I guess it could escalate to the Supreme Court, but the chances of that are very slim. So yeah, I'm sure that's, I'm sure you understand what that means as far as hierarchy goes. Anyway, so let's go to criticisms of the current court system. And the biggest being that 
the entire docket of many courts is very overflow, overwhelmed, overflowing with cases. And that kind of leads to it being very difficult to get a speedy trial, which you're technically guaranteed in the Constitution. And it's hard to get a speedy trial when there's a thousand people in line in front of you with minor infractions. So that kind of leads to a kind of a stress to get to, it leads to people wanting to, or people being stressed to plead guilty a lot to avoid the whole trial process and it eases up the stress on the docket. So that's a pretty big issue. Instead of going to trial, they're just like, let's speed things up, just plead guilty. You'll get a lesser sentence, that kind of thing. And like, this video is turning out to be a train wreck, kinda, so just email me with questions if none of this makes sense. Of course, none of you are gonna watch this till like two days after spring break anyway. But anyway, so state Supreme Courts, let's talk about those. It's kinda like the state version of the main Supreme Court, obviously. And in most cases, instead of the president doing the nominating, it's the governor doing the nominating and then the state Senate confirms them. Some of the different states have different procedures. Like everything, it just all depends on jurisdiction, where you're at, what the system is. And some states have really large Supreme Courts, like Texas kinda has two Supreme Courts. That's a whole story. Texas does everything differently. And then you've got Alaska. I think they've only got like two or three Supreme Court justices and they don't even have their own building. They just kind of meet in a room in the Alaska State Capitol building. So yeah, appellate courts, that's the kind of court where you go to to appeal something. It's in the name, appellate court. So if you don't think you got a fair trial, if there's any problems with your trial, anything like that, you will appeal your whatever verdict you got to the appellate court and they'll look at it that's how that works. Specialty courts, we kind of already covered those a little bit. You've got divorce court, which is a very, with a very limited subject matter jurisdiction. You've got small claims court, which is kind of fun. I love small claims court, which is kind of where you go if you're taking somebody to court over something really small, like a $20 item and you're not going to take that to a huge court and spend hundreds of dollars on legal fees to get back $20. So that's why you've got a small claims court. You've got juvenile court. That's its own thing. We'll go into that in detail a little bit later. It's pretty complicated. And anyway, I think that's where we're going to end it today. Since no one's going to pay attention to this anyway. I'm going to save day two of this week for the next time we meet in person. And we're just going to kind of pile that into everything else. And at the beginning of class, if you all have any questions about stuff we covered today, we'll do that too. So yeah, have a good spring break. Don't get COVID.